Hi, this is Professor Robbins. Um, by now you should have already watched The Graduate. If you haven't watched The Graduate, then don't listen to the screencast. <laughs> um, and that's really actually only if you don't want me to ruin the ending, because it will happen. Uh, but if you don't care about the ending, then you're welcome to listen to this first. If you've actually seen The Graduate a long time ago and you already know everything that happens, I would actually then recommend that you listen to this and then re-watch the movie and then you can see how everything syncs up. But I'm going to show you how uh, Vogler's Hero Journey applies to The Graduate. Just as a recap, these are Vogler's 12 stages, and they are divided between Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. If you notice, Act 1 just takes you through the ordinary world all the way to crossing the threshold, so they're going to run this way. Act 2 looks bigger on Vogler, but still usually ends up being about a third of the text. Um, and what happens is it's going to be Test and Allies is actually going to take up the largest portion of Act 2. Uh, approach is usually pretty short. Ordeal is sometimes fairly short. And then the reward is mainly more symbolic than like a long standing phase. And then you're going to get into Act 3, which is about kind of the return. Uh, notice, by the way, that this circle split in half and that you have the ordinary world here because the hero is ultimately going to return to the ordinary world after having been changed by the special world. So let's talk about this in regards to the graduate. Act 1 is called separation because it's when a character thinks they're happy, they're in the ordinary world, having a good old time, they think everything's fine, and then they, till they realize that there's actually something that they're missing, that there's something that they're going to need to quest for. And so they have to separate from who they were in order to go on this journey and leave what, where they've been. The graduate is actually really easy to track the act changes, and every act begins with um, a black screen and then it fades into the film and then a Simon and Garfunkel song is playing and so you can actually see how what's going on based on the Simon and Garfunkel song so if it fades to black and is black for a little while and then it starts up again with the Simon and Garfunkel song you know you're in the next act act one begins with the song sound of silence and I have it up here because the wording's really telling, the idea of being in darkness. Um, and the idea of visions, this idea of these seeds while I was sleeping is really about there's this hint of something being amok. And this created a vision that was planted in the character's brain, the speaker's brain. So the song is really about kind of loneliness, but it's also thinking about the seeds, the idea that something's wrong, that this kernel of knowledge that something's amok is there, but this person still is in the sound of silence. Benjamin starts off in the ordinary world, and his ordinary world is pretty boring. Uh, there's lots of early sequences with him paired in the same uh, frame with like a dark bored or a sad clown and so nobody seems to really care about him uh, even at the party that's being thrown for him nobody really seems to care that he's there so the ordinary, ordinary world is a place where Benjamin feels lost he doesn't really have a sense of identity and he's missing purpose Mike Nichols talks about that there's three words that define the ordinary world um, the first one is plastics and this is a pretty funny moment at the party where this guy just says one word plastics and he just keeps repeating it but if you think about what plastics symbolize like plastic is um, a, like a made product it's not something natural it's been created and plastics all look the same if you ever saw the movie Mean Girls the girls who are the really popular pretty ones are called the plastics and that implies rigid can be broken easy mass produced all looking the same and that fits with Benjamin's ordinary world where everybody seems to be in this kind of yuppie middle class sphere in which everyone looks alike glass and mirrors is another big one glass and mirrors, mirrors usually symbolize duality that there's two sides to you and there's two sides of everything um, and a glass it's gonna in your mirror reflection reflection sorry it's gonna look like you but it's not like you so the fact that he keeps encountering glass speaks to fragility um, but also speaks to a sense of duality 
and then there's water. Um, water is really important because of course there's a scene in which his parents give him the scuba gear and he has to perform this thing where he goes underwater and just seems to be stuck suspended there. He's also like looking through the fish tank at water. Water usually implies the idea of baptism and rebirth that you'll be cleansed and purified. Water also speaks to the idea of something that's clear and something that can be seen through. Um, something that's maybe opaque. So Benjamin's in his ordinary world and then he gets to his, the call to adventure which is when Mrs. Robinson asks him for the affair and of course Benjamin is terrified by this. Um, it's the great moment where of course he calls her out on the idea that she's trying to seduce him and she kind of laughs at him and it shows how uncertain and kind of I don't want to say unmanly but somewhat unmanly Benjamin is. The call to adventure is usually signaled by what's called a herald. If you think about Alice in Wonderland, the herald is the white rabbit. Alice is having this kind of dull life. This white rabbit shows up and she's called to adventure and so she chases the white rabbit. Mrs. Robinson is the herald. She brings up the idea of a fair and sexuality and kind of a rebellious thing against his parents. But of course, Benjamin's going to refuse because he's not ready for this affair. Um, he doesn't want everything that that would mean. Because remember, Mrs. Robinson is the wife of Benjamin's father's business partner. <laughs> so Benjamin has probably known Mrs. Robinson since he was a kid. Um, so it would be particularly strange that all of a sudden she's soliciting him for a sexual affair. So he refuses the call, says he's not interested, turns her down. And then you're going to get his his change. Uh, the moment where he changes his mind happens at this party where his parents horribly, horribly embarrass him um, because they make him dress up in this suit. And by the way, I hope you noticed that in Benjamin's bedroom in his fish tank, there's a little scuba diving man that's plastic at the bottom of it. And so when he's, Benjamin's dressed up like this, that's supposed to be a reminder of that little guy in the fish tank. So his parents, for his birthday, put him in a suit and parade him out in front of his parents. And they don't listen to the fact that he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't actually want to be part of this event. And so this really stark reminder that Benjamin has no voice and no power and no authority is really what calls him to decide to have this affair. So... At this point, he calls Mrs. Robinson, and she is going to become his mentor. A mentor is a teacher or a guide. Mentors are always going to give the hero a gift, and that gift is one that is going to help the hero complete the journey. If you think about Star Wars, Obi-Wan Kenobi is the mentor, and he gives Luke the lightsaber that's going to help him continue. So there's a way in which most mentors are there to help a character change. And when a character kind of stagnates on its quest, often the mentor is going to step back up and change. However, you've probably noticed that in a lot of movies, the mentors die halfway. And that's because they've given the hero everything they can. And so now it's the hero's job to continue. Some mentors become dark mentors. Whereas a mentor should reflect the most idealistic version of the hero. They're the best version of the hero. Think about Dumbledore to Harry, um, Obi-Wan Kenobi to Luke, uh, the Glinda the, and Wizard of Oz to Dorothy. The mentor is going to be the best version of yourself. Uh, they're the thing that a hero is going to try to strive for. However, they are often dark mentors. And these are ones that start off being the spiritual, ethical guide to the hero and then fall and then become somewhat poisonous. Uh, if you saw Batman Begins, um, Ra Ghoul to Batman is a fallen mentor, a dark mentor, because he's teaching him something that Batman doesn't want to be. So Mrs. Robinson is going to step, step up as Benjamin's mentor. And that's because she has a lot of the things that Benjamin lacks. 
Uh, if I were going to play traditional gender roles, Mrs. Robinson is probably actually more manly um, or masculine. She is powerful. She says what she thinks. She's uh, sexually out there. She is confident. She can boss anybody around. Benjamin, on the other hand, would be considered, in a traditional sense, the idea of feminine, that he's somewhat passive, he's somewhat weak, he's a little bit more uncertain, he has no control. Again, those are just traditional backwater ideas of masculine femininity, femininity but they do represent what Benjamin is going to need from Mrs. Robinson, that through her, he's going to become more sexualized, and he's going to play a lot more with his sense of power and authority, which currently Benjamin lacks in a big way. So he calls Mrs. Robinson, and at this point he's going to cross the threshold. If you were to rewatch this scene, what you would notice is there are so many barriers that pop up. I chose this picture, and by the way, hopefully what you've noticed is I've been choosing pictures from the film that correspond to each of these stages. But even in this picture, it's partly blacked out because of the the bars on the phone booth. Uh, when he goes to book the room, he actually talks to the man through this kind of wooden scrolly thing and so that divides the frame and seems to put up barriers. When he tries to get into the hotel he holds the door and all those people start coming out. There's so many things in the Taft Hotel that seem to be telling Benjamin to stop but he calls her anyway and one of my favorite scenes is he's bought the room, she's sitting in the bar, and he calls her to let her know the room number, but he forgets to tell her that, and so she says, Benjamin, isn't there something you want to tell me? And he says, thank you, it's really, basically does the little kid thing of like, thanks Mrs. Robinson, I'm glad that you invited me over. Um, and it's a great moment to show who Benjamin is, he's still childlike, he's still somewhat immature. You get the sense of, she almost even bullies him into having sex by questioning his masculinity. The moment where she's smoking and she's take, taken off her shirt in the hotel room and Benjamin comes up and puts his hand on her breast, that was a complete, completely improvised moment um, from Dustin Hoffman. And he was playing with this idea of he doesn't even know how to initiate the seduction. So he does this kind of overt thing and she doesn't even care. She doesn't even respond. So this sets up a lot about, again, their power dynamic, his uncertainty, and then the way she bullies him and having sex with her is she questions his sexuality and points out that he's probably a virgin and this is probably his first conquest. And so in bullying him in that way and kind of calling his masculinity into play, he then gets the courage to have sex with her. So I'm going to stop here because I don't want all these screencasts to run on. So this is Act 1 and then I'll break and then I'll come back and tell you about Act 2.